Hello and welcome to another episode of Local Expert Interviews. My name is Michael Grady and today we're going to be interviewing Dr. Peter Fedor of Los Angeles, California. Dr. Fedor is a board certified plastic surgeon and an expert in the field of body sculpting. Dr. Fedor's skill and expertise in cosmetic surgery has been recognized by top surgeons in Los Angeles and across the world. Welcome Dr. Fedor. Thank you Michael. Dr. Fedor, please tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and your practice in Los Angeles. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. I practice in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, also in Aspen, Colorado. And I teach at UCLA where we train plastic surgery residents in the art and techniques of plastic surgery. My practice encompasses uh, not only body sculpting, but also other aspects of plastic surgery, such as facial surgery and injectables. The two things I don't do is hair replacement and laser resurfacing. As an expert in the field, today we would like to talk to you about breast augmentation. So please tell our viewers a little bit about breast augmentation and is it a commonly performed uh, procedure? Currently when you look at the statistics of our national society, which is the American Society, for aesthetic plastic surgery and incidentally I've been president of this organization a few years ago. Um, breast augmentation is the most commonly performed operation among all the aesthetic procedures. It and liposuction are about the same but I think breast augmentation right now has a little edge over liposuction. Well let's talk about the differences in the procedures for breast augmentation. Um, I understand that uh, there's silicone and then saline. So could you kind of talk to our viewers, which, uh, what's the difference and which one might be better than the other? Uh, breast augmentation can be a little confusing to patients and I think it's important for them to select a surgeon who is uh, familiar and comfortable with using either a silicone field implant or a saline field implant. In addition to the filling material of the implant itself, they are, uh, they are also uh, an issue about whether the implant is placed under the muscle or above the muscle, whether the incision is made under the breast fold or at the breast fold or around the nipple area or possibly even in the armpit. So some surgeons are married to one procedure, one approach, only one kind of implant. In our particular practice, we spend quite a bit of time in determining each patient's individual needs in figuring out what is the best kind of implant for them, what is the best location for the incision, and what is the best plane of placing the implant, whether it's above the muscle or under the muscle. Because we believe that different approaches may work slightly better for each patient. So we kind of custom tailor the operation to each individual patient. I understand the difference in putting the implant above the muscle or below the muscle. Is it better one way or the other? Well, again, it's no better. It's a question of what's best for that individual patient. For example, if somebody has a fair amount of their own breast tissue to start with, so therefore the implant, if placed above the muscle, will still be covered by a fair amount of tissue, I think those patients are good candidates for placing the implant above the muscle. On the other hand, patients who have very little breast tissue, if any, and uh, just basically have a nipple but no breast tissue, if you place the implant above the muscle, the implant will actually end up just to be under the skin. And that's not a good choice from the standpoint of capsular contracture or uh, palpability of the implant itself, etc. So this is the kind of things that you have to evaluate in each patient. When patients come for consultation, we have a set of measurements to make on them. The distance of their nipple from the middle of the chest bone, the amount of soft tissue that they have above the nipple, under the nipple, and these are the kind of, um, kind of factors that make us be able to recommend for each patient what might be the very best approach for them. So in that respect, it can be complicated when patients 
kind of think about and read in the internet, etc. But usually, the best surgeon for any patient is a, pa a surgeon that's familiar with all the approaches and selects for each patient what's most appropriate for them. That's very good information. And I think that uh, one of the biggest concerns that uh, we have found in our research is firmness and breast firmness. What's the chance to develop breast firmness after an augmentation? Well, I'm any patient basically can develop breast firmness after augmentation. The firmness comes from scar tissue that the patient deposits around the implant. However, there's a big difference whether this is 50% of all the patients that they give a surgeon the surgery on or 2 or 3% as it happens to be in our practice. And the difference is uh, uh, based on uh, many different factors, including the finesse and the technique and the gentleness with which the tissues are handled, the sterility of the packet where the implant is placed, because many people believe, including myself, one of the main reasons for the breast firmness is a low-grade infection around the implant. It also depends on um, the patient being instructed or doing certain exercises of massaging in a certain way the breast mount. It also depends on during the surgery all the little blood vessels that might have been opened in the process of developing the packet where the implant goes into to be well controlled because another reason for breast firmness after augmentation can be a little bit of blood escaping around the implant. Bottom line, nobody knows the full reason why breast capsules can develop. But if, like in our practice, we pay attention to all these different factors, and as such, we are able to minimize our capsular contracture rate to, like I said, 2 to 3 percent. Now, that doesn't mean that if somebody falls into this 2 or 3 percent, for them, of course, is 100 percent, is that we can do things afterwards if a patient did develop a capsule, and that gets kind of a lengthy discussion, maybe not appropriate for the, for the short program, but oftentimes changing the plane where the implant was placed, even before that starting patients on certain medications that can be somewhat preventive for capsule formation. So there are things that you can do about. The most important thing to know that in spite of the fact that there is some capsule formation in connection with breast augmentation. The great majority of patients in a, in a practice that is um, uh, conducted by a properly trained surgeon who select the patients in the proper way, the great, great majority of the patients are ecstatic with the results of the breast augmentation. That's why the population is so common. That's why the procedure is so common because it is, it is indeed very successful. It is common and successful, and I think probably the main concern that a woman might have is, is the uh, procedure for breast augmentation, is it painful? Well, it again depends on the technique a lot, depends also on the patient, the patient's threshold. The great, great majority of our patients on the day of surgery, they can go shopping, and I mean that literally, not only the out of bed, but they can comb their hair, they can move without being encumbered at all. We give them little uh, post-surgery exercises that we do right away in the recovery room with them, and our patients in gen general complain of very little if any discomfort. Again, each patient's individual pain threshold is also an issue, but as a general rule, no, there isn't much discomfort with the augmentation. There should not be. That is really, really good information. So what would you say on average, what's the average recovery time? And how long does it take before somebody can get back to normal activities like going to work? Well, it's, um, the, the, the recovery is gradual. Like I said before, our patients can go out for dinner that same night when they had the procedure or they can go shopping. That doesn't mean that they don't have some mild discomfort. In general, we advise patients not to lift while we like them to move their arms, 
we don't like them to lift anything heavier than 30 pounds for about two or three weeks. That is important because when one lifts some object that's a little on the heavier side, then internally there is an engorgement of the little blood vessels and a few of them can open up. There can be a slight minuscule microscopic bleeding around the implant, which is not the kind that the patients have to go back to the operating room for, but is the kind that could be a factor for capsule or contracture to develop later on. So we kind of we, 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 we provide patients with the appropriate instructions how to best take care of themselves in order to get the best possible result. Dr. Fedor, you have given us a lot of really good information on the breast augmentation procedure. I'd like to thank you for being on this interview. I really enjoy talking with you, Michael. Thank you very much for interviewing me. Again, my name is Michael Grady. This has been another episode of Local Expert Interviews. We've been speaking with Dr. Peter Fedor. If any of our viewers would like to get more information about breast augmentation or any other cosmetic procedure, please refer to the phone number at the bottom of the screen. Thank you again, sir. Thank you, Michael.